So before we get into today's episode, I just wanna let you all know that my limited time plushie is finally live. It's over at makeshift.com. Link will be easy peasy right in the description box. I know many of you were upset that last year you missed the opportunity to get the very first one. So here is the second one. This year, the pyramid's got a little bit of blush. She's a little bit cuter and she's got a big 3D teacup so that she can help you hang out and spill the tea every time a new episode is uploaded. This plushie is only available for, I believe it's three weeks and then it's done. It's a limited time release. Then Makeship goes into production and it takes them a couple months to fulfill the orders and then they ship them out. So you've got right now for the next couple weeks to purchase one if you want it. If not, they're gone forever. So make sure to check them out at Makeship. Link is in the description. Using technology originally intended for encrypting data securely, non-fungible tokens are the latest permutation of the ongoing craze for cryptocurrency. Everyone's making them, everyone's buying them. No one has the faintest clue what they are or why anyone is doing this. Today, we're going to break down what those words mean and what exactly are the risks for dipping your toes into NFTs. So hello and welcome back to another episode. I'm Blair, and today we're investigating the crypto craze and NFTs. But what is an NFT? Well, it stands for a non-fungible token, which means it's a token representing an asset that is not fungible, i.e. not able to be exchanged for an equivalent item. A dollar bill is fungible because it's just like every other dollar bill and they're all worth the same. Your childhood teddy bear, Mr. Cuddles, is not fungible because even if I offered you an identical one in trade, you would probably not value it as highly as the one you actually had as a baby. So look, this stuff is obviously complicated. Every single concept in this episode requires me to explain three more concepts, all of which will take even more explanation. And at that point, the episode will be nearly 10 hours long and I'll have to give you course credit for it. But before we can talk about NFTs, we have to talk about cryptocurrency and the blockchain. And to do that, here's what we're gonna need to understand. Essentially, everything that exists online is built with code and code reduces to numbers and letters. Hashing is a term for scrambling code for encryption purposes by running it through a complicated math algorithm. The goal is for any size input to be outputted as a hash, a collection of symbols of the same size as every other hash, with the additional requirement that the hash look close to random while still being deterministic. In other words, you should always get the same hash from every output, but you shouldn't be able to easily figure out what the input was by looking at the hash. That means that small changes in the initial input should result in a very different hash output and that it should be as close to impossible, as you can manage anyway, for two random inputs to generate the same hash. Lastly, it should be impossible to reverse the process and enter the hash into an algorithm to get the unscrambled data. Hashing is often used for securing messaging and verification, which is why when big companies get hacked and it turns out they stored their user data in plain text, everyone in information security yells and throws things at them. You can easily save a password, for example, as a hash. When a user wants to enter a password, you just run it through the algorithm again on your end, and if the hash matches the one you've saved, you'll know you've entered the correct password. That way, if your server gets hacked and your data is stolen, all that the thieves get is a hashed version of information, which is functionally impossible to decrypt into the plain text version. Now, that's not to say it can't be done because it can theoretically, but the only real plausible way is through pure brute force random checking, which takes time and a lot of computing power. This stuff gets complicated quickly and any actual mathematic or cryptographic experts in the audience are already screaming at me and shaking their computer monitors because of how badly I've oversimplified it. But we're going to have to leave it there because now we need to talk about the next portion of things, the blockchain. So once you have this basic hashing idea, you can use it to verify that someone gave you the same information as someone else without any of the three of you having to personally trust each other or even know what's happening. The innovation of blockchaining is taking the hash from one record, adding more data, and then hashing it again. The resulting hash thus contains both the new data and the old hash. Then you can do it again and again and again. In other words, making a chain out of these blocks of data. As long as each new link in the chain contains the previous links, you have a verifiable record of transactions. This has a lot of potentially useful applications, such as for sensitive data transfers or managing a supply chain, essentially supply chains involving say, high-end machine parts or medical supplies. In other words, products that are very expensive, but can be replaced with cheap knockoffs without anyone noticing until it's too late. 
The use that everyone has been talking about it though is when it deals with cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency is the amazing new money that no one understands, but everybody wants. So the way that this works is, okay, so you have hashing, right? And then you have blockchains now. So the brainwave here and the fine idea in principle, no shade, is that you set up a big distributed network of peer-to-peer connections and use that to store records of a particular blockchain. The first transaction recorded within each block is special, a coin with a requirement that for each new block to be approved and added to the chain, it needs to have a certain number of zero bits to appear in front of it. Remember that hashing acts like a random number generator, right? So that means that trying to deliberately get the algorithm to output a specific number is impossible unless you attempt to brute force it. And you're checking over it again and again and again until you get a hash that meets that criteria. Each new block requires more and more zero bits in front of it, which means that as time goes on, the amount of computer processing power required to generate a new coin gets bigger and bigger. So even as computers get faster and faster and more people start mining, the number of new coins stays fairly limited. Scarcity makes value, and there you have the basis of what's going on here. And now after rushing through way too much, way too fast and delving into the actual nitty gritty, not at all, we are finally ready to talk about NFTs. Non-fungible tokens, NFTs, use blockchain technology, but unlike coins, which are designed to be traded at the same value regardless of whose coin it is or where it came from originally, an NFT uses blockchain to log the data for a specific piece, usually of digital art. This makes it a token representing ownership of that artwork, whether it's a music video, a dance, a specified image of a particular caramel macchiato taken at a certain time, place, day, the possibilities are endless. In principle, NFTs work along similar lines as limited edition prints. The artist makes a certain number of prints at a certain time, maybe signs them or does something else to mark them as special and then sells them for considerably more than what you would pay for a poster that has the same art on it at a museum gift shop. Or think of stamp collecting. The stamps that are really valuable are the ones that are the rarest, which tend to be extremely old or from runs that have some unique misprint that no other version of that stamp will have. This practice dates back to the beginnings of photography and printing, when it started to become possible to reproduce a nearly limitless number of copies of a given work. Art has always been valuable, most not because of what it's made of or even how nice it looks. I've seen some really lovely pictures in hotel rooms that I'm sure were bought by the truckload or for a few bucks each, but that's because of what it is. The art was made by this person at this time and in this place is irreplaceable and it's unique. Printing and photography, particularly analog photography, because the film negative is the source of all prints made of any given image, needed a way to make that scarcity feel real again. Or else art would become valueless and everyone would have to sell their cameras or something. Of course, within art, everything is totally subjective and made up anyway. Why delete? See, why delete? Yes. Why paint? Why leave? Why die? What makes a piece of art valuable is the fact that it's perceived as valuable, mostly determined by who bought it and what they were willing to pay for it. If a piece of art suddenly becomes unpopular for whatever reason, it abruptly plummets wildly in worth. So NFTs, digital art made Ansel Adams' headaches seem like a mere pinprick. Suddenly, not only could the artist make a huge number of copies of a given artwork, but anyone could, and not just a few prints might have their own little imperceptible flaws, but perfect copies. Infinite perfect clones, a nightmare of art. And to be fair, the nightmare of art under capitalism, since I'm sure a lot of artists would be quite happy if literally everyone in the world could enjoy their art at once, as long as they got three hots and a cot out of it. Lisa, I want some more. How could anyone possibly create a non-physical artwork that could become as valuable as an old oil painting or a grand sculpture? But blockchain recall inherently has the property that is in itself a record of everything it's done. If you make a block that starts with some information about a particular piece of art, and then you have a unique identifier that will record every time it is transferred to a new holder, that's a blockchain of custody. You can buy that block and know for sure that it was sold to you by Steve who bought it from Jenny, who bought it from, and on and on and on. I think you get the idea. You can trace it all the way back to the person who first made it. No one else can ever own that exact token. It's as unique as old Mr. Cuddles the teddy bear. Now we're talking scarcity and that means cash. 
The poster child for the new glory days of NFTs is Mike Winkleman, AKA Beeple, a digital artist whose work every day is the first 5,000 days sold as an NFT at a Christie's auction in February, 2021 for over $69 million. Nice. Whenever large amounts of money get involved, that means scammers, thieves, grifters, and general lunatics are all close following behind. So welcome to the age of the NFT scam. The first problem is one that's likely to see some improvement via technological wizardry. But for now, a pretty major concern is link rot. We've all been to websites with a link to something that looks cool and we click it and oops, we got a 404. Or worse, it's trying to sell you non-folding umbrellas or a timeshare or just straight infects your computer with a virus. Dead links or links that get bought and sold or hosting companies that die or change hands, any number of things can cause a particular website to disappear. And right now, the images that most NFTs refer to are hosted on websites. The link to the website hosting the image is included in the NFT's original block. What does that mean? Well, it means you can drop $100,000 on a unique picture of a pig wearing a propeller beanie, and then a couple years down the road, you go look and oops, the picture's gone. Poof, no piggy, no beanie. Congratulations on your $100,000 404 error. You still have the picture, of course. You've been using it as your Twitter avatar and you had it tattooed on your thigh. But if you upload it again, it won't be at the URL that your NFT points to and NFTs can't be edited. And that's kind of the whole point of them. That permanent locked in link now goes nowhere and your beheaded pig is mere bacon. You were planning on selling that bad boy for a cool half a million and buying a house, but now you have nothing. Now, since what everyone agreed was valuable in the first place was your unique identifier in the form of an NFT, it's certainly plausible that people will continue to treat the NFT as a token of that art, even if it doesn't actually point to any image. If that's just a case of a server going down, perhaps the problem can be resolved with a few phone calls to hosting companies to get things back up and running. However, we're talking about potentially very large sums of money. Do you really want to depend on the generosity and honesty of strangers when it means the difference between someone paying you a fortune or a pittance for your little receipt of ownership? Some NFT minters have taken other steps like using devices such as Interplanetary File System or IPFS. IPFS is a distributed file sharing network, like those old networks that college kids used to swap songs before Napster was invented and then died. And now I guess Spotify or SoundCloud or something, I don't know. As long as the image file is hosted somewhere by someone on IPFS, the NFT will point to it, in theory. Now note, this doesn't always work. Some notable NFTs have already had hiccups where they disappeared from view. So far they've all been recovered, but it did take some effort. Another issue that crops up with NFT is good old fashioned theft. Remember how NFTs have a nifty feature that lets you track all the way back to the originator? Well, unfortunately, there's generally little to no oversight to ensure that the person who mints the NFT is the person who actually owns the art that they used to make it. Which at that point, if you are the artist and you are rightly peeved that someone else is selling your art for hundreds or thousands of dollars, you just have to deal with it. You can resort to old fashioned intellectual property law, but that's gonna take a very long time. Consider the sad case of Ching Han, an artist who started to cultivate a truly impressive following for her lovely portraits and of course, her detailed drawings of popular anime protagonists. She went from 20,000 Twitter followers in 2018 to 200,000 in 2020, at which point she was unexpectedly diagnosed with cancer. She tragically died at only 29 years old in February of that year. Later in 2020, Zhe Han, Ching's brother, who was handling her estate, discovered that an NFT of her work, Birdcage, had been minted and sold on Twincy. She contacted Twincy and the particular NFT was frozen and removed with a DMCA takedown. But in the process, he found a handful more NFTs of his sister's work being sold with the possibility of new ones popping up at any moment. Or what about the anonymous United Kingdom man who goes by Pranksy online? A big fan of the famous and famously unpredictable graffiti artist Banksy, Pranksy spotted an NFT of one of Banksy's works on sale on Banksy's website with a time limited auction to buy it in August, 2021. Being apparently just a big old Captain Moneybag, our dude ponied up about 224,000 pounds in Ethereum cryptocurrency to snag the token, only to discover afterwards that it was a scam. Banksy's representatives said Banksy had not minted any NFTs or sold any on his site. It seemed that someone had hacked the site, put up an auction and give it an air of legitimacy. After Pranksy made a fuss on Twitter, he unexpectedly got his 200,000 pounds back less the 5,000 pounds that the transaction had to cost to perform. This is known in Ethereum circles as gas. No one had any idea what happened. And honestly, it might as well have all been Banksy. And I mean, literally every person involved, possibly including me, like no one has any idea ultimately. 
Speaking of people who seem to be constantly pulling weird gags on everyone, there's Monsieur Penson or Mr. Nobody, a self-proclaimed white hat hacker and his NF theft project. He has reportedly developed a technique he calls sleep mining, a play on sleepwalking, in which he can use the normal Ethereum contract software, how you initiate transactions with Ethereum to cause a Giffen artist to mint a new NFT in their own wallet and transfer it into the wallet of Persone's choice, all without anyone realizing what has happened. If the artist catches on later and makes a stink, the blockchain will show that the NFT originated in their own personal wallet, just as if they'd made it deliberately. To demonstrate the weakness he uncovered, he minted a second edition of Beeple's Every Days, the $69 million NFT we mentioned earlier. Beeple's wallet then sold this second edition for a pittance to the account named Arsin Lupin, which then sold it onto the market normally, where it caused quite a stir. He also claimed that he's not behind the Lupin account, but you know, the first buyer for Frenchy McFrench, Mr. Nobody, is a French name who is also the name of one of the most famous gentleman burglars of all time. It's, it's got prank vibes. Analysis of the Ethereum person used was of little help, but it was considerably bulkier than the normal contract with over 4,000 lines of code and the transaction it initiated took over 12 times the normal amount of gas that an Ethereum transfer usually requires. So it's clearly doing something. Artnet journalist, Tim Schneider contracted Monsoor Person via email and Person told Schneider that he would reveal his secret technique only later after he felt he had garnered sufficient attention to the issue of security around NFT minting. Person also claimed to be a strong supporter of NFTs and cryptocurrency and blockchain generally, attributing his attention and desire to improve the infrastructure. He also believed to think that his counterfeit NFTs were totally legal and fine. But given that he has sold what was not his, it seems to be fraud, right? Plus he didn't do any transformative work. He just downloaded the image from the artist's site and uploaded it to his NFT to point. So I don't, I don't know. It just seems like regular vanilla copyright infringement to me. It seems like we can be fairly consistent that Persone has discovered some kind of vulnerability in the massively complicated software, but I guess I'm saying I wouldn't recommend going to him for legal advice either. A famous gray hat hacker who worked for several US intelligence agencies once wrote a book describing how he pulled off some of his most famous hacks, cracks, and heists. He did not delve into technical arcana or show off some overclocked PC. He would just call the front desk and ask for, say, John, a name he'd pulled off the company's website. Once he got John's number, he'd call and ask for someone else, then call them and say he'd spoken with John and so on and so on, with all the employees helpfully providing assistance until he had enough information to call someone serious. Then he would pretend to be an employee with an important job and convince them to send files to an email or provide him with door codes so he could simply walk in the front with a suit and a briefcase. Hacking, in other words, is a social skill. And these old fashioned confidence games still work just as well as they ever have. For example, Andrew Wang at The Verge spoke with an anonymous man who had a problem accessing one of his NFTs on Oversee, an NFT hosting service, and posted about it publicly. At that point, someone named Nate contacted him, invited him to a Discord server named Oversee, and told him this was where they did customer service work. A handful of very helpful people came and went trying to assist this user until finally someone suggested he share his screen with them. At which point the scammers who had been impersonating helpful staff promptly took all his account information and transferred half a million dollars in NFTs out and away into the wild. Now, because of the nature of the blockchain, these NFTs were easy to locate, but by the time they'd been tracked down, they'd been sold again and their new owners were not aware they'd bought stolen property. Blockchain transactions, remember, cannot be reversed. So the only way for our dupe to get his property back was to offer to buy the NFTs from the current owners. Some of the new holders were happy to help, but others, particularly those holding NFTs that had spiked in value, were not thrilled at the idea. The very traits that make NFTs desirable and useful were a serious impediment once they'd been snatched in this way. Now, speaking of Nate and Oversee, the Nate that those scammers were impersonating was probably meant to be Nate Chaston, who was OpenSea's head of product up until September. And that's when he was caught buying up NFTs just before they were to appear or be promoted on OpenSea's front page and then selling them for considerably more immediately afterwards. This behavior is no different than the sort of corruption seen in Wall Street fat cats or underhanded congresspersons, insider trading, plain and simple. After a public outcry, Chastain got canned, but the whole NFT space is still a bit of the wild west, little in the way of specific laws or regulations. So there's no guarantee that any further incidents will be handled even as well as overseas manage this one. Now, before we continue on to talk about the environmental impact of NFTs, this is where I'm gonna place today's sponsors. 
The holiday season is for eating and enjoying time with friends and family, not spending time in the grocery store. Instead, get HelloFresh to send their fresh pre-measured ingredients and delicious recipes right to your door. And because they've got seasonal hookups right now with recipes like balsamic fig and beef tenderloin or pecan crusted salmon, it will help make the holiday meals feel special. And all without the high cost of dining out or delivery. Or get cozy comfort food choices like chicken sausage and sweet potato soup for cold, cold nights. And all my soup people, FYI, I can vet that this is in fact a delicious soup. I myself love soup. Soup, sweaters, and comfort, okay? These are my three staples in life. So the second I started to see that HelloFresh was pulling out the soups for the fall and like holiday and winter season, you bet your bottom dollar I was all over it. Let me tell you, it is delightful and easy to make. So if you wanna get HelloFresh, get some amazing food delivered to your door, get some soups going to fulfill your life, go to hellofresh.com slash MLM14 and use code MLM14 for up to 14 free meals and three free gifts. That's up to 14 free meals and three free gifts at hellofresh.com slash MLM14 and use code MLM14. This episode is also sponsored by NordVPN because just because the holidays are here and you're spending maybe time with family, time out on the road, traveling if you have to, whatever, whatever, you need to make sure you're keeping yourself safe. And NordVPN is easy to use. Connect with one click or enable auto connect for zero click protection. They have over 5,100 servers in 60 countries. So it's easy to find a server near you for better speed or in a faraway location for more content. And you can access it from anywhere, so you don't have to miss your favorite content. Even when you're traveling abroad, you can stay at home virtually. It takes just a click, open the map, click on a location, and you'll be connected in seconds. It's just that easy. You can unblock your favorite games and geo-restricted servers. Don't let that location limit where you can play. So this year's holiday season deal is really straightforward. Go to nordvpn.com slash Illuminati to get a two-year plan plus one additional month with a huge discount. Again, go to nordvpn.com slash Illuminati to get a two-year plan plus one additional month with a huge discount. It is unequivocal that human activities are responsible for climate change. In addition to the risks of your personal financial well-being, blockchain technology has a significant environmental impact. Every transaction requires a proof of work to be accepted into the chain, which means basically recalculating all those hashes, which takes both time and energy. Then recall that new cryptocurrency coins, which includes NFTs, are deliberately designed to become harder and harder to make, requiring even more egregious amounts of computing power. Remember last year when everyone sold out of video cards, basically like forever when all the new 30s, 70s, 80s, and 90s came out? That was because crypto miners were buying them up to use in their quest to calculate new coins. Worse, as their popularity rises, so does the computational cost of mining and trading, which means that the coins individually become more valuable, thus attracting even more miners. And ultimately, it means I will never be able to get my hands on a 3080 Ti. No matter how much I beg, it is gonna be overpriced by like $1,000 and I'm just not gonna do it. Energy obviously is not free. It has to come from somewhere. And right now, for most of the world, it means burning fossil fuels. You may have heard about climate change, right? So now we're burning some astounding amounts of electricity and not even getting a cheeseburger or a trip to Spain out of it. It's hard to assess exactly how much the carbon footprint of a given crypto transaction is. There are some sites who have tried to do so, but the whole thing is an exercise in relativity. Try to calculate the carbon footprint of say, one person flying on a jet. It depends on how many other people are on board, how heavy the luggage is. And then you have to consider that if enough people want to fly on a particular jet, the airline company will add more flights along that route. How much did one person wanting to go to Bermuda contribute to all that? And how much blame can we accept for participating? The good news for NFTs especially is that they make up a tiny percentage of total cryptocurrency transactions. And there are currently researchers looking into ways to mitigate or reduce the cost of individual transactions. For example, using a second layer to do transactions offline and bring them back into the blockchain afterwards, although this really only mitigates it for high frequency traders who do a lot of back and forth. Or there are some crypto brokers who have centralized and made their blockchains private, enabling them to allow transactions of coins and NFTs to occur only with proof of stake rather than proof of work. 
And remember, to add a block to the chain, you have to prove your work by doing all this math again and adding your data to the end. For proof of stake, you hand the central organization a percentage or portion of your crypto as collateral, and then you trade on your platform without all the proof of work. But this comes with an understanding that your stake is forfeit if you try anything shady. Proof of stake lowers the barrier for entry, not only allowing more individuals to participate in the blockchain, but also decreasing the total computational power needed exponentially. Cryptocurrency was all about getting away from centralized banks. So reinventing the concept of banks gets a pretty lukewarm welcome from the majority of the most dedicated fans. And of course, there are crusaders wanting to mine and trade cryptocurrency using clean solar and wind power, but we can't even get regular people to use enough clean energy yet. So if we have all this clean power, wouldn't it be better to use it to like transport people and grow food instead of powering a gigantic pile of servers so they can calculate random numbers really hard? Maybe once we solve the whole climate-driven extinction of large animal life on the planet problem, maybe then we can circle back to the crypto stuff. Now, there is another byproduct of cryptocurrency and NFTs, one more toxic and corrosive than even the foulest coal plant runoff. All this talk about freedom, individuality, and no banks and infinite money, just by owning a computer. It's catnip. Not only that, but it's catnip to a particular personality type and they have thoroughly infested the grounds by now. This is a significant problem because here in its infancy, the NFT industry is mostly built on communities and trust with art fans wanting to show some truly special pieces made by their favorite artist. Into this gossamer web of intersectional connections comes, well, to put it bluntly, rare Pepe's. Okay, so basically Pepe the Frog is a whimsical and harmless cartoon frog that used the urinal with his pants all the way down to his ankles. Like that's apparently how this whole thing started. And yeah, you can find tons of photos of him everywhere. He's a common reaction image and there's even emote servers and discords dedicated just to Pepe. So yeah, that's the briefest overview in the whole world. On 4chan, there were repeated jokes about collecting rare Pepe's, drawings of Pepe the Frog that no one else owned with the joke being that once you posted them, everyone had them by default. As far as jokes involving Pepe, this is about as lighthearted and harmless as it's gonna get. But now with NFTs, there actually can be rare Pepe's. And so there are. At a 2016 Sotheby's auction, an NFT of Pepe the Frog in a business suit entitled Pepinopolis sold for $3.6 million. Two other rare Pepe's sold at the same event, though for only tens of thousands each. NFTs of horrifying, offensive, or plain bigoted material are also commonplace, given that the type of person who thinks it's funny or clever to do that sort of thing has a strong overlap with the type of person willing to spend time and resources on countercultural technological financial fads. Here in this whole blasting, mind shriveling wasteland of 2021, aggressive proponents of NFTs have taken to decrying the right click mindset, which is what they call people who point out that they have bought something that is technically worthless. Remember that what you pay for when you buy an NFT is the token, the receipt of payment, not the physical image or the copyright or anything of that nature. Anyone can still just, well, right click and download the image for their personal use if they want, just like any other publicly posted image. If you're not selling it or pretending to be the person who made it, the law doesn't really care. However, the people who populate the grosser parts of the internet really hate this because we suspect. We know that these are absurd pieces that are not sustainable. NFTs as a concept have some strong potential utility for art and artists in the long run. NFTs as a fad are just post-mortem beanie babies. So angered by people who point out things are real and exist or facts that affect outcomes, the braying NFT mob who has declared war on the right-click mindset. Witness Right Click Save This, an NFT minted by Vincent Van Doe, not his real name, but very punny, on November 14th, 2021. It consists of an image of Pepe extending the middle finger over a banner saying lawsuit material call 1-800-SUMI, superimposed on a background consisting of 100 images of personas, artwork of alternate selves often used as avatars by members of the furry community. Van Do did not, of course, obtain permission from any of the artists or users involved in the sale of their images. He immediately sold this NFT for approximately 20 Ethereum or $100,000. Once this misappropriation became more widely known, several of the artists whose art had been incorporated into the grotesquerie complained. Foundation, where the NFT was minted and OpenSea, where it was sold, immediately took it down, blocking further transfers. This prompted the buyer, Kento Insami, to pretend to be angry, posting on Twitter, "'I politely demand to speak to the Foundation CEO right now, like fucking right now. I bought a pic of a furry for $100,000 and I see no furry due to your incompetence. Either you give me back my furry or I will sue with the best US lawyers. 
Once it was explained to him how to still go and view his image, presumably through very small words, he crowed about his success on Twitter, writing, your move furries. Meanwhile, Van Doe claimed a grand political win, saying he'd taken art from the loudest critics of him and whatever he imagines his project to be. Of the artists who address questions on this front, all say they had no idea who he was and that maybe he posted some memes making fun of NFTs at some point. Van Doe then offered to pay $5,000 to the artists if they would mint their images as a single print NFT and send it to his Ethereum wallet. Given what we know about NFTs and their value and what people will pay to own the libs or whatever the mindset really is, I'm not quite sure what they're going for here. Um, This is patently insulting as an offer. But let's start to wrap things up on a slightly happier note. NFTs offer a particularly interesting option for adult performers whose best material is by nature fairly transitory, but who really thrive on their personal relationships with their fan bases. An NFT as a sexy memento is about the best possible cause and several adult entertainers and artists have climbed to the top of the bandwagon. These workers make far more money selling an NFT than a usual from a single image. And they tend to already have the loyalty of the type of fan who would find the idea of a unique and personal token from their favorite artist highly appealing. Jen Stein, an adult artist, had been promoting the idea of NSFW NFTs under the title, Building the Cock Chain. And I have presented this entire slew of confusing information just to tell you that one fact. There are concerns about the increasing use of NFTs, of course, the lack of regulation, although that's hardly new for sex workers, and the fact that several blockchain hosts and generators prohibit inappropriate material for their NFTs, with the result, as always for sex workers on social media, that content can sometimes abruptly disappear without explanation. Still, building the cock chain, like if you're gonna remember one thing and nothing else, I hope it's that, building the cock chain. So with that being said, I wanna thank you for tuning in to today's episode. If you enjoyed it or learned something new, make sure that you're liking, following, and subscribing. Don't forget to comment as well and let me know what you thought. Make sure to go check out my Linktree link where you can find my candle shop, Twitch, Twitter, all other forms of social media. You can also check out my podcast if you wanna hear some of this content on the go. And if you're even interested in extra content and more behind the scenes stuff, make sure to check out my Patreon. Links of course are all below in my Linktree link. So thank you so much for tuning into this episode. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.